Good morning, and welcome to another great December hangout. Um, December is 31 days of STEM fun for the whole family. Um, it's created by Girl Start, and it includes hands-on activities at December.org, and then also great um, guest hangouts like we're doing today with the San Diego Zoo and Rick, and he has fabulous friends to share with us, and we're very excited. So we have um, a classroom from um, Texas, and then we have another classroom all the way out from California, and we're just really grateful that everybody could be here this morning. And we're going to turn it right over to Rick, because I know we all want to know um, who his friend is. So thank you, Rick, for being with us this morning. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for involving us in this program. We do love it. Now, don't we? Can you say hello? Hello. Good job, buddy. So, yeah, my name is Rick Schwartz, and I am an ambassador for the San Diego Zoo and our safari park, our sister facility to the north. Uh, my job history has been as an animal care supervisor, a uh, senior keeper, uh, even a part-time keeper, and basically all my background and my knowledge comes from the science of observation, or basically watching and understanding the behavior of the animals. And that's more than just sitting there and watching with your eyes. You also have to do a lot as far as uh, understanding where they fit into their ecosystem. And we're so excited to be part of the STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math, because all of those things fall into not only zookeeping or the care of animals, but also then, too, with the conservation animals, which we're very much a big part of all around the globe. Uh, San Diego Zoo is well known for what we do right here on zoo grounds, but we're actually located in about 35 different locations around the world right now, spearheading or partnering about, in about 100 different uh, conservation programs. So Rio here is a double yellow-headed Amazon parrot. It's a very long name. just means he has twice as much yellow on his head than the other parrots that are Amazon parrots and obviously found in the uh, rainforest areas. So to properly care for Rio, we have to understand a lot of the science behind what makes Rio tick. What's important to Rio? What does he need for his health? And where does he fit into his ecosystem? So you see bright colors on him, of course. He's showing off his tail feathers right now. Look at that. <clears throat> All these bright colorations to you and I against this background here in our auditorium. Well, he seems to stick out quite clear. It's not very good camouflage at all, very easy to see. But if you look out, now this time of year might not work for you depending upon where you are, but if you look up into the trees in the spring or summertime, which is more what the foliage looks like for where he's from, you'll see it's not just one color of green. You'll see there's light green and dark green, there's even yellows if there's any flowers or fruit. And as the sun comes through those leaves, it breaks up the shadow patterns. If Rio thought there was a predator in the area, he would slick his feathers down and not move and not say a word. And he'd actually disappear right into the forest that way. Now, of course, right now he's very excited. Again, you see him fluffing up and he's talking and everything else. Uh, Rio's been doing educational programs for over 20 years. Uh, people don't always realize these birds live for a very long time, and he's still considered fairly young at 20 years. Uh, so he's quite used to doing these programs, and because he was hand-raised, he probably has some inclination that he might be a human with feathers, not really a bird. And that's because birds will imprint. Again, something we've learned from observation of the species. They'll imprint on what raises them. So in the wild, they imprint on their parents, and that's what they know their future mate is supposed to look like, and that's what they identify themselves as. In the zoo environment, where Rio is hatched right here at our zoo and hand-raised to be an ambassador, well, he was raised by people, so he very much enjoys being around people all day long. In fact, the bigger the audience in the presentation, the louder he gets. Real, real quick, let's show off a little bit. Can you say hello? hello. Where's your whistle? Cell phone? Cell phone? Good job. That's all he knows on the cue, but they are very smart, and they can learn a lot. And those adaptations of being able to learn and change your behavior or vocalize differently come in very handy in the wild when you're trying to mimic other animals to perhaps scare off another animal or mimic other parrot families so you can be part of that family also. Now another really cool adaptation, because you're, you know, Rio here is a rainforest animal, being able to hold on to the branches and climb around in the trees is very important. And that's because in the rainforest where they're found, the trees are very dense. They're close together, lots of plant life. So you're not just going to fly from tree to tree. You're actually going to maybe go up to the canopy of the rainforest, fly over to another tree, and then climb down in there. So the feet of the parrot family is rather unique. If you can see here his toes, he's got two in front and two in the back. Most birds were accustomed to seeing, like eagles or even ducks for that matter, three toes in front and one in the back, and that's for grasping and walking just fine. For Rio, though, not only can he use those toes, two in the front and two in the back, for climbing, but check this out. He can actually hold on to his food, just like you and I would hold on to a banana or an apple. So a very unique adaptation because, again, they're going to be climbing around in the forest, and what they're going to eat is mostly fruits and vegetation. 
Now watch as Rio eats this peanut. He's going to use his lower jaw, just like you and I when we're chewing gum or playing with candy in our mouth. Our jaw can go forward and backward and side to side. Our tongue can help manipulate things very well. Some people believe the beak of the bird simply works like a pair of pliers, but their lower mandible or lower jaw, just like yours and mine, can manipulate things very carefully. Now one other thing is Rio chews on the peanut. You'll also notice he's dropping some of it too. They are very messy eaters. We feed Rio about, well, almost about two cups of fresh fruits and vegetables every day. He consumes maybe one cup, and the rest of it is evenly spread throughout the area. Now, logic would dictate why would you waste that much food? This doesn't seem like a very good plan at all. When you're in the wild, you don't necessarily know when your next meal is going to come. And in the zoo environment, we don't want to waste food, of course, so feed him less. Well, even if we fed him less, he would still make a big mess. He would still, about 50% of what he's offered or what he's got in his foot or in his mouth will fall to the ground. Again, doesn't make much sense to be such a wasteful feeder, but let's look at their role in the ecosystem where they're found in the rainforest. They have the luxury of going from tree to tree, finding the fresh fruit, and getting the best meal. There are many animals on the forest floor, though, that cannot climb up those trees and get that fresh fruit. So they rely on this messy heater, what we call a drop heater, to then offer food down to the forest floor to many animal species, insects, mammals, uh, even reptiles, that may not be able to go up in those trees themselves. And the other side benefit, too, if you're a tree, of course, has seeds in it. Well, if they're going to be messy eaters, tossing up seeds as they eat, those seeds might actually go further from the tree. <laughs> those seeds might go further from the tree than the tree could actually drop. So a very important role in the ecosystem. Drop a very important role in the ecosystem. All right. Now, another very interesting thing about the parrots is that uh, they have very good vision. Now, we know we heard the term eagle eye or hawk eye. And the vision, we talk about vision in parrots, it's not necessarily <laughs> vision in parrots, it's not necessarily <laughs> <laughs> We don't necessarily talk about the distance, we don't necessarily talk about the distance how well we can see. But we're talking about the acuity, or how clear things are, and this color spectrum. Now, we know in the human eye, the rod cones, these are the cones. These are the uh, The rods are nighttime vision, cones are color vision, and rods also do black and white. But we know from the anatomy of our anatomy of our when we look at the anatomy of the parrot, we see an fluctuation of the, the cones or a clarity of color. In fact, some scientists believe that some scientists believe the reflection spectrum. This is a spectrum that the human eye can see. Perhaps some insects and some birds like the parrots can see that, and that allows them to pick out the most accurate uh, fresh coloration uh, of the fruit to, to leave other fruit to ripen and to get that other fruit then that would be tasty for them. Oh, you see how Rio's demeanor just changed? Behavior observation right there. He slicked his feathers back for a moment. He's kind of listening and not moving as much. It's exactly what they would do in the wild if, for any reason, they thought a predator was in the area. Now, we had some birds down the way just do an alarm call, uh, and so he was responding to that. And a great example of how in the forest, uh, birds and other animals rely on each other. You hear an alarm call over there, you better slick down and pay attention. There might be something there. Uh, so a great example right there in the zoo uh, of that sort of thing. Now I'm going to put real way. We're going to do some questions at the end of the, the segment here. I have one more uh, rainforest animal that I want to show you. Now, keep in mind, a lot of what we talked about with Rio with some of his adaptations, the zygodactyl feet, two toes in front, two toes in the back, the unique uh, ability of the beak uh, as far as being able to move just like our lower jaw and do those different things, mimicking to help either attract other birds to be part of their family, or to attract other animals, perhaps to scare away other animals, depending upon what the situation is. We also talked about his coloration and his camouflage, or in this case, right now, flaring up to show excitement, which would be important then for other uh, birds also when being around him. So those things to keep in mind with Rio. Uh, I'm going to slip him away over here real quick. I have one more animal from the rainforest that is well known, and uh, <laughs> it's Rio. He likes to be a part of every program. <clears throat> Okay, so very popular on the internet right now is an animal called the sloth. Uh, we have with us right now a two-toed sloth who is snuggling with me. Can you see her in there? Let's see if I can grab the camera a bit. Now, she snuggled in my jacket not because I like to do cuddles necessarily, which I don't mind the cuddles, that's for sure, but sloth have a slow metabolism, and in the rainforest where they're found, they require... Um, you know, usually a very normal temperature or temperature that doesn't fluctuate too much. So with that, with the cool in the morning season at the San Diego Zoo, uh, I have her in my jacket here to help keep her warm. 
Now she's a two-toed sloth, and that name comes from right here. I don't know if you can see. Let's see. I'm going to move the camera again. So I don't know if you can see her, her little claws. She's holding on well. Now the two-toed sloth uh, does well in the zoo environment. The sleep three-toed sloth doesn't do quite as well. Uh, so the two-toed sloth is one you're going to see more often uh, in programs and whatnot. Now Zena here is just a youngster. She's only um, well, she's just under a year old, and so she's been working with us for a while now, a few months. And she does pretty well with our educational programs. There's a good shot of her face there. Come on, do you want to see the face, baby? Now check out this coat real quick. I do want to show you this. The coat of the sloth, they, they hang upside down. Uh, the, the, we're going to move the camera around to make a better view. The coat of the sloth is uh, very coarse hair and very dense. And it actually, instead of like most animals going from head to toe, it goes from her belly to her back because they hang upside down all the time. I'm just going to check you guys out. <laughs> Now, what is interesting, though, you, know, you see Xena here. She's nice brown and sort of blonde cinnamon colors. In the wild, though, they become green. Uh, they don't move much. Like you know, sloths are very slow with a slow metabolism. They live in a warm rainforest, and therefore, algae and moss will grow on them quite well, which has actually been difficult for them because you know what that does? That's built-in camouflage. Up in the rainforest trees, you don't move much, and you're just kind of hanging out like this. And guess what? You're going to blend right into your environment and be able to not be eaten by predators such as the jaguar or a harpy eagle uh, or even large uh, tree-dwelling snakes might go after the young sloth. That's good, right? Now, sloth eat primarily the leaf and twigs of, of trees that they live in. Uh, some sloth, from some recordings that scientists and observations that scientists have done, they call it a home tree because the sloth very rarely leaves it. They may stay in one tree their entire life. Now, they do come down about once a week. That's Rio. You'll get your food. You'll get your food. <laughs> yeah. So the sloth will come down about once a week to go to the bathroom. Now, with that, it seems kind of weird to only go to the bathroom once a week. But it's kind of weird to only go to the bathroom once a week. But the food that they eat does not actually um, give them a lot of energy because it is high in fiber and low in energy. So it works out quite low in now, no, scientists are 100% sure why no, they climb down, 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 uh, but some scientists believe that, uh, that helps deliver no, their waste right right to the base of the tree, their waste and actually the fertilizes then the tree. So they live in a the symbiotic relationship. Now, now the symbiotic relationship, the relationship between the plants get a relationship as well. You mentioned the thick coat here that you has. There is a moth there is a called moth called and believe it or not, because believe it or not, so dense, it so algae dense. in there. Algae in there. There is actually a miniature, there is actually a miniature, a miniature in the sloth's hair. Uh, it's something you wouldn't normally expect, but hair. it's really important. This whole uh, moth's life depends on the sloth. But it's really important. This They'll live moth inside moth the hairs here, eating up algae and some of the dead skin. They'll live inside the hairs here, eating up algae and some of the dead skin. body healthy. It helps the exterior. And so the moth offers up in a safe yes, haven. And when the sloth goes down the safe haven, go to the bathroom, well, guess what the moth does? That's when the moth will go down and lay its eggs in the stools, or, if you will, for lack of a better term, the poop of the sloth. And therefore, the moth relies not only on the sloth then for uh, its food source, but also the eggs, once they hatch, the larvae will, it's kind of gross, but they'll eat the stool. And that's their energy source. And once they hatch out, they fly up into the tree. They find the sloth and start the whole life cycle over again. And everybody benefits that way. So well, a lot of times when we look at animals like the sloth here, we think how very cute. Because she is adorable. No doubt about it. She is cute. You look at real, he's fun, bright colored, entertaining because he talks. But the more we learn, the more we dive into the science of biology and behavior, Yes, Rio, you'll be next again. Uh, we start to learn more about how every animal plays a very important role in the ecosystem. Now, both these animals that I'm sharing with you today are from the rainforest uh, of South and Central America. Rainforests band usually around the equatorial portion of our world. So you have rainforests in Africa and Southeast Asia also. It's a very small percentage of our entire global ecosystem. But in that small little band around our globe of the rainforest carries a large percentage, a huge percentage, 
of the living creatures of this planet. In fact, rainforests have the largest amount of diversity or amount of different animals and plants than anywhere else in the world. So a very, very important part of our world lives right there in a smaller percentage of the world in the rainforest there. Now some other fun facts about the sloth here. Let's see if I can get her to come around. You guys can see her face one more time. You can see, hopefully, she has small little eyes. Now they don't necessarily need she to see small very well. Little eyes. Now, they don't necessarily need to see very well. We see a lot of um, we see a lot of internal um, that have large eyes, and they are mostly active at night to avoid predation. And again, their activity is pretty small. Um, but she doesn't need to see very well. When we think of nocturnal animals with big eyes. We might think of owls. Owls are hunters. They need large eyes to bring in as much light as possible because there's not much light at nighttime to see movement and to be able to hunt that way. Well, being a sloth, living in the grocery store, basically, if you think about it, she lives right in the produce section, right, and having her own home tree, uh, she doesn't have to worry about hunting her food. She just wakes up, walks over on a branch, has a snack, goes back to sleep, wakes up, has another snack. She's right there. Uh, so the eyes aren't very important for taking in a lot of light at nighttime. Now, you look at her nostrils. You can see she's got a pretty good-sized nose. Now, the sense of smell when you're a plant eater is fairly important. Sometimes certain uh, things may or may not be ripe, and your sense of smell can pick up on that. Or there might be certain parts of the tree that um, are starting to decay and be old. You wouldn't want to eat that. wouldn't be as nutritious. Not that they're getting a whole lot of nutrition. Now, if you ever go online and you see a sloth that is smiling, Believe it or not, the three-toed sloth, now Xena here is a two-toed sloth. The three-toed sloth, though, the way their jaw structure is and their lips move around or are, are on those jaws, they actually always look like they're smiling. It's not been photoshopped. So it's kind of a fun way that you can look at the picture of just the face of the sloth only and know, ah, that's a three-toed sloth. Or if it's not smiling, it's a two-toed sloth. So a little insight there for you, again, how observation allows us to maybe see something without having to count the toes on the sloth. So kind of a unique situation that way. Now, believe it or not, <clears throat> sloths are even born up in the trees. Like I said before, they only come down to go to the, bo the bottom of the tree to go to the bathroom. So when a sloth is born, mom gives birth hanging upside down in the tree. The baby climbs onto her belly and stays there. And then, of course, as she grows, she'll venture out on the tree on her own. And they do quite well for themselves. And they do have ears also. Let's see if she'll let us see one of her ears. It's tucked way down in her hair here, but there it is. So not quite a big ear flap like you and I have, but it's right there, and that's the ear canal then right there too, and it's all covered by this hair. And it keeps, it, keeps the water out then while she's out there in the rainforest. Very important for her. Let's see, what else can we tell you guys? Like I mentioned, um, oh, would you believe now, looking at her, this is one other fun fact that science shows us. Looking at her and her body, you see, you know, we talked about the sharp claws for hanging and whatnot. When they're on the ground, they don't move very well. They actually have to pull themselves along with their front legs. Their back legs can't push them along very well. They do, however, swim fairly well. Their long limbs allow them to have a nice stroke in the water. But you're looking at her, you might guess she's related to, oh, I don't know, maybe a bear or maybe a monkey, maybe even, I don't know, an otter because of the shape of her head. But believe it or not, science shows us this particular species is related to anteaters and armadillos. Very interesting, isn't it? Because they don't look anything like anteaters and armadillos. And most anteaters and armadillos don't actually have teeth. They have little pegs to grind up the insect in their mouth, or they use their tongue to grind up the insect in their mouth. Oh, well, these aren't insectivores, and also they do have about 12 to 18 teeth. So very different. But because of the lineage of being able to look at DNA now and the science behind all that, uh, it's fascinating to find out who's related to whom. Now, I'm going to put the camera back up on the computer. We have about 10 minutes left, and I want to be able to take some questions from the classroom. So give me just a second to set that up. We have some of you classrooms on mute, so we're going to change that also so I can hear you guys on this end. And we should be all set here. Okay, come here. I'll keep Zena here in my jacket so she stays warm. And let's see here. Well, that was, I, it was so cool that all of a sudden I've been talking to you all morning, and I had no idea that she was <laughs> It was That's a great surprise. Um, all right. So, um, Caitlin, do you want to pick up questions for? Yeah. It does um, anybody have any questions um, for Rick, either um, about the parrot or the sloth? And if you do, you can come straight up to the camera and then ask him the question. Um, just so you know, too, the one that's uh, labeled, I'm sorry if I say it wrong, 
Zoe. Ms. Rodinez, your classroom still needs it. Ms. Rodinez, your classroom still needs it. Okay. There we go. All right. We got everybody. There we go. All right. We got everybody. Okay. So, which? Okay. So, which? Caitlin, which class would you like to do first? Unfortunately, Caitlin, your classroom still needs it. Caitlin, your Sorry to say, sound quality. Sorry to say, I can. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any video of yeah, the family. Unfortunately, we don't have any oh, no. video of the family. Oh, goodness. I'm oh, no. showing. Um, All right, my lesson oh, okay. in any other class in my own class would not be any other class in my own class. That's very unfortunate. I have a okay. question. Well, Sorry, oh, wait, come on up. Okay. I do have a question. I, I, yes. Can you hear us? Can you can you tell yes, us sir. about okay. what would be a typical uh, educational path for uh, zookeeping? Oh, certainly. There's an actually a really good way to get into zookeeping. Um, it's actually okay. oh, because it's a multi uh, okay, right there, Tony. Right there. job and the things you need to know and understand about your animal. You uh, you can okay, go in from a very right strong there. zoology background. And I, you, nowadays, uh, you have a bachelor's degree in either biology, zoology, and believe it or not, even behavioral sciences such as psychology will also qualify you. Because a large portion of the job is observing the animals and understanding what their needs are for for the best uh, emotional and, and mental state, basically. But also a lot of our work involves hands-off training. So when we do a lot of training on the protective contact, we don't necessarily go in with the animal, but we have to train them to switch from one way to another or to go into a crate. Well, we have even animals who are trained to accept medication via injection voluntarily. Well, they'll come into a certain area to uh, get them. And that's all done basically through behavior modification with positive reinforcement. So there's many different routes. I highly recommend those studying the biology sciences, uh, zoology, uh, psychology, any of those three really find what really inspires you and excites you the most. Then the other side of it, too, uh, there's also ways you get involved working with zoos and animals out in the field and that would be ecology, uh, looking at the sciences of what the animal's needs are in the wild. And we take a lot of what we learn from animals in the zoo and apply it then to our conservation efforts in the wild and vice versa. We learn a lot about the animal's needs in the wild and apply that to better care practices here at the zoo. That's great. Um, I think we have another question from our um, Texas classroom. Okay. You did. You did. Oh, there we go. Yes. I said There we go. Hi. So Hello. How, do, how slow does a sloth move? A sloth will move. And a sloth will move. I need to be a sloth will move less than a tenth of a mile in an the hour. It's so very slow that most people never hour. see them, even it's if they so share an area with them. We have many people who do guided tours throughout the rainforest who do studies in the rainforest. And one of the hardest things to find are the sloths. They know they're there because they're the sloths. They're very hard to find because they move so slow. Wow. They're very hard to find because they move so slow. Wow. Rick, did you say. If the baby finds their the tree after they're born, yeah, you know, when they're born, they do things like that. They are mammals, of course, so they spend they are mom nursing. Course, so they and as they grow, then they'll start to flow out into their own tree, and, or into the end of the tree they're born into, of course. And then as they become mature enough to have their own territory, like many other species, they will establish their own territory, usually somewhere near their mom. So they might grab a neighboring tree, be their home tree. Now that said, although scientists have observed that many sloths will stay in the same tree for most of their life, sometimes they will move on to another tree whether because something chases them out, whether it's another sloth or a predator. Um, so every now and then they will get down and climb, or they will you know, make an a, a effort, actually, to drop into the water uh, when the tree hangs over as a way to move on to else, because they do swim rather well. 
Do we have any other um, questions? I'm so sorry that our California classroom can't see a video, but do you guys have other questions, um, maybe just from um, listening? Yes, we do have another question. Um, can you tell us what is the average lifespan of the sloth? Uh, in the wild, usually anywhere from 10 to 12 years, maybe 15 if they're lucky. In the zoo environment, though, you can live usually 15 to 20. And it's not uncommon for most species of animals to live longer in the zoo environment because, of course, there's well, there's no competition for territory. No one's trying to hunt you. Uh, you have food readily available every day. There's no one taking away your habitat. And, of course, then there's, uh, you know, should anything come up medically, well, we have a great veterinary staff that takes care of them that's here on grounds all the time. So we tend to see longevity when we do a bit further than uh, in the wild. Thank you. And I'll tell you what, too, in, in, for the classroom, since we're having some sound and, and audio pro, or some audio and visual problems, if there are any other follow-up questions that you guys might think of later uh, after having a discussion in your classroom or maybe researching more about sloth or Amazon parrots on your own, you can tweet me on Twitter, Zookeeper Rick, it's all one word, or San Diego Zoo. Either of those Twitter handles, we monitor them all the time. I'd be happy to take any questions and get back to you with some answers. Now, of course, we are limited to 140 characters, so don't ask really deep, involved questions. Uh, ask some basic ones if you could, or maybe I can drop some links in there for you to, to help answer your questions. And, and Girlstart can also um, give the links to um, their, their Twitter handles on our December page as well, so um, people can find um, all of your information um, in multiple places, which is great. So. Um, are there any other questions from either group? Oh, I, I can see Chuck What's your girl question? Up. Um, um, I think one girl's going to come out. One girl's going to come out. When they have what? When they have babies. Okay. Um, they want to know how old they are when they are when they have babies. Like how old do they have to be to be mature enough to have young? Yes. Okay. Usually around two years of age is when we'll start seeing the females become uh, mature enough to breed. Now, the gestation or time it takes for a human baby is about nine months um, to basically fully develop before they're born. A sloth, well, they're much slower, so anywhere from 10 to 11 and a half months is their gestation period. So, it, and they will only have one, and the mother's got to place it. So, obviously it's a sloth, so it's a very slow process to have your baby and to raise your baby. But it does work very well. But it does work very well. How much do sloths end up weighing when they get to maturity? A uh, female sloth of this uh, particular species, the two-toed sloth, can get anywhere from 8 to 10 pounds. Uh, males can reach 15 pounds, depending upon you know, genetics and everything else, but those are the averages. Okay. And Gina here is just a, a young, she's not even a year old yet, so she's probably about 6 pounds right now. We'll get one last parting shot. I know we're running out of time here, so let's see if we can get a... Let me say hi to everybody. She's so sweet. <laughs> Yeah, she is. She's very sweet, very gentle. Uh, we are fortunate enough that uh, we were able to co-raise her with her mom, so she got all the needed sloth raising uh, from mom. But mom was nice enough to let us handle and work with her too. Uh, so she's a great little ambassador to allow us to uh, show people up close and personal uh, what the sloth looks like and talk about how important they are to the ecosystem and they have their own little ecosystem on their body and give people something to think about when it comes to uh, rainforest education. That was so fun. Thank you so much. I have, once again, learned tons. Um, I hope that our classrooms, I know that we did have some sound and video difficulties, but this will be up um, on both um, San Diego Zoo's um, YouTube page plus um, at December.org um, to be able to watch later so you can see um, how cute our sloth is and um, how vocal and colorful um, the parrot was. Um, that was also very, very cool. Um, so once again, we just appreciate everybody um, for participating in December, um, and we are so grateful um, to be able to, to hang out from Texas and be able to talk to people all the way out in California, so that's always really fun. Um, so Rick, thank you again for you and your friends. And, My pleasure. And as I said, everybody, we will be posting this again to December.org, um, but it will also be on San Diego's YouTube page as well, and hopefully we'll... Um, Get lots of other questions later on, um, um, just asking about about your friends. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.